it's one step up the ladder at a time. And no, like it, you take your lumps and that is how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. There has to be a degree of learning. If you go into a situation where things are hitting the fan and you're in a, you know, let's say a war or something like that, you want to be surrounded by Navy SEALs who are hardened, battle tested, mm -hmm. seen the ups and downs, seen all kinds of situations. That's the, probably the safest place you can. Level it up, Nation. This is your host, Brigham Black. I'm so grateful to have Nick D'Angelo on today. He's the CEO of Saint Investment. Now, let me tell you a little bit about him, why you definitely want to check out what he's up to. He's the fixed income go, like greatest of all time, guys. He's He's got a portfolio of over 206 million, which is phenomenal. And we're going to dive into a little bit of why that's so impactful and how he's been able to help so many people with his Saint Investment Group and cure and how we can really use some of the CPR is what we're calling this to fix a lot of your economic issues. And we're going to have a great conversation today. So Nick, welcome to the call, my friend. How you doing? Brigham, great to be here. Really excited to jump in. Great catching up with you beforehand. And yeah, I'm really excited to uh, jump in on uh, what we were kind of getting into before this and uh, what we're about to jump into. Sweet. Well, our topic today is CPR. And I think this is interesting because it's not the, the typical CPR we're looking at. When you look here, this is CPR for the revival of your assets. So let's first start off with an asset. An asset is something that puts money in your pocket. I love Sharon Lecter's definition of that. So reviving assets, this is something that you guys... You, you live and breathe this. You, you see these distressed properties. You're like, ah, there's money in those, those things right there. We need to figure out how to, how to redo this and put some value into it. So let's, let's talk about there. What was it that first drove you to learn how to revive assets? So my background is kind of classically trained with a couple – small family offices. So I worked with individuals that were giants at the time to me. I mean, I was, you know, very, very broke. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be around the most successful people. I wanted to um, get to the highest possible level that I could. And the fastest way to get there that I found was to make it easy for them to say yes, to bring me on and to be as close to their success as I could. So the best way I knew to do that, because I graduated college in the wake of the Great Recession, right? Mm -hmm. The global financial crisis. I said, I, you know, I reached out to these groups over and over and over. Most told me no, most didn't respond, right? Yeah. But I found a couple, got closer to them and just was over and over conversations. How do I work with you? What can I do? I'll work for you for free. Both passed on hiring for me, me for free, by the way. Wow. So great <laughs> lesson in the fact that their time was so valuable that they didn't have time to teach me for free or have a free employee. They needed someone to bolt on immediately that was adding value to them because their ship for all intents and purposes was shrink, uh, was, was sinking in that market environment. So what I needed to do, what they needed from me was to source and find assets. And I didn't know acquisitions at the time. I was very young. I was very inexperienced. I did have a background in real estate marketing because I had been doing leasing for landlords, even as a teenager, kind of early, I tried to get in. So the biggest opportunity in the market at that time was distressed assets. And the better you were at sourcing distressed assets, really the more value you could add. So to these individuals, whether it was us doing the deal, whether it was us was bringing, or whether we were bringing in partners, there was a few different models that we went into, but I leaned into acquisitions, which was a strength of the marketplace at that time. It was an opportunity unique to that market. So we still have that mentality today. We still believe that some of the biggest opportunities lie in problems in the marketplace. So when the sky's falling, when there's huge issues, uh, when there's things that are market disruptors in a massive way, I'm like, this feels like home, baby. Like I'm good with it. I want opportunities. And when people aren't willing to do the extra work, which is 99% of the time, most markets, then there's huge opportunity to innovate. 
I, I think that's a really beautiful way to think about problems as your savior. You think about the bigger the problem and the more value to see that this is something that is worth paying for. And that pain is so, so difficult. They don't want to solve it. If you're willing to solve it and you have a great way that you market yourself so they can know about you, man, you've got a wide open ocean of opportunities. So this idea of distressed properties, I, I've i heard of Warren Buffett saying when people are running from a burning building, that's when you go in. <laughs> Let's talk about why that's so important to identify these distressed properties. And after you've identified them, what is that strategy to actually acquire them? Because you have to get them under contract. You have to take them off the market, even if you don't even know if all the numbers work perfect yet. You're like, hey, this hits our minimums. Let's see if this is something we actually want to do. So there, I'll give you two answers because there's two there's two mm -hmm. of the same coin when it comes to distress. Assets. One is the first answer to your question is it was a function of the that mm -hmm. of that market environment, right? That market environment, if you speed back the clock, you know, 15 plus years, 2008-ish, right? Let's take that. 50, so that market at yeah. that time, deals were everywhere. We were swimming in deals. We were swimming in deals. The issue was the uncertainty in the market was so ridiculously high. So everybody today, oh, yeah, I could have made money back then. I could have, would have, should have. No, because at the end of the day, it took a very, very strong mentality and very, very seeing through the weeds, seeing through the smoke and mirrors of all the different things in the market to understand that most deals were below replacement mm. costs, okay? Mm. Meaning in order to buy that asset, it would cost more to build that asset again than to buy it in that market environment. I mean, deals were everywhere, Brigham, right? The issue was nobody had mm. money. Money was nowhere to be found. The top five banks in the United States during the global financial crisis were at risk of going under. There were bank bailouts, yeah. remember, right? So that was a function of that environment is, you know, and we all are. The market's bigger than all of us. It's the joke, don't bet against the Fed or, you know, et cetera, um, or bet on the Fed, go with the Fed, right? Like it's, it's the idea that there are wheels that turn that are bigger than you and I. So now if you zoom back into the market and where we were, there were deals everywhere, but there were concerns on most of these deals. And there was, a you know, market questions, economic questions. So but they weren't in that marketplace. So knowledge and understanding and economic environment was something we had to drill down on. How we hedged against that was to buy ridiculously aggressively, meaning our basis, our purchase price was so low that no matter what the market did and market fluctuated, we were only doing cream of the crop purchases, the best purchase prices with, we understood the risks in each property that we went into and we were very okay with whatever that risk was yeah. on those deals. So that's how we leaned into it. I was in a unique position to be around very wealthy, very successful individuals, but they didn't have the boots on the ground approach. They weren't as tech savvy. So me being extra young at the time was a was an asset, not you know a liability. And I think you know again, I think the younger generations today have the same opportunity in a older industry like real estate that doesn't innovate as quickly. And that's how I leaned into it. So half of it was a function of the environment, a function of the marketplace that I had to you know, exist. We all had to exist mm -hmm. at the time. The other what the other half of that is how to lean directly in to that marketplace and take the most advantage of it. And for us, it was being so aggressive on the purchase price, only buying the top 1% of 1% of deals, sometimes underwriting two, three, 400 deals to find that premium, perfect deal for us at that time. And that's how we managed a crazy sky is falling market. Wow. So the one percent of the one percent is your, I mean, is this right. cream of the crop. I mean, something every like that. Two to three hundred properties that we underwrite, wow. maybe four hundred. So, how large was your team to be able to take that much work in before you could actually profit? Because I mean, two hundred plus deals, just you're not making any money when you're doing that due diligence. It's when you have that actually come to fruition all the way through the pipeline that you have any money. So, how did you guys manage that? Early on, it was a, it was me and two other individuals, and I had uh, I was you know lucky to link up with one guy who was, I mean, really a mad scientist, an absolute mm -hmm. killer 
at due diligence. His level of detail was borderline insane, right? And uh, I, his skill set still to this day, he's a dear friend. We keep in touch. We compare notes on all kinds of market dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, but so I was blessed to have him. I was more, I had to kind of roll up my sleeves and be a little more entrepreneurial, kind of yeah. directing traffic and being setting the vision more. Even though I was very young, I was working with people much more advanced. I just was like, these deals aren't marketable. I can't take these to our guys for these reasons for, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The market dynamics here won't go the way you think they will, et cetera. So I kind of had to set vision early on. I had to build that skill early on. Today, the team's expanded a lot, right? We're around 20 team members. Uh, we do things quite a bit differently. Today, the market dynamics have shifted. Mm -hmm. In today's market, there's mountains of capital. There's so much money out there, right? A lot of it's on the sidelines. We could talk about on the sidelines or institutional or what that money's doing, but there's more money than we've had in, you know, decade plus. On the other half, deals are more scarce, mm. right? So now capital raising was very big in the global financial crisis. Those guys that had access to capital were very, 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 um, they were, they had a lot of leverage in the deal partnership. Now today, capital is still very important, but you're seeing access to deals, access to returns, access to stability on assets being much more highly valued and rightfully so. So we've shifted into a model where uh, we deal mostly with assets that are very relationship-based. Our purchases are almost exclusively off market. We're not really buying things on market. By the time we see something, we know that we've already passed on it. So if something comes on the market, we're like, yeah, we passed. For sure. We've already underwritten this deal. So um, now we look for very specific levers. We have very specific channels that we look into. And the biggest thing that we're focusing on, back in the day, we were very focused on tiny details in the marketplace. We're looking at bigger trends in the country now. We have assets in 21 states, wow. right? So we have to look at what national trends. We have to look at impacts of elections, right? This isn't a political comment saying, I mm -hmm. prefer, or I think, and this guy's bad and this guy's good or anything. This is a comment saying there are implications to who is next, our next president and who's, you know, what their decisions are, whether it's the IRS or the economy, et cetera. And we need to actually plan for those nationally. Now we have different concerns and different things we're tracking. We have to know what the federal reserve is doing and what their game plans are for rates, for quantitative easing or tightening, what their game plan is for all, you know, reserve requirements of banks because we have enough money in the marketplace and enough deals that we're looking at that we're trying to see into the future as much as we possibly can. Hmm. And with that increased preparation and increased looking at all the different elements of the market, that, that gives you guys more of a faith to know this is what, with all the data that we have, this is what we see is going to happen. You can never really completely predict the future, but the more prepared you are, this is something I want all my listeners to hear, the more prepared you are, you're eradicating that fear with data and the inputs and the better you understand those patterns of progress, the easier it is to say, well, I think this is what's going to happen because of the data. Now, you're not making database decisions. That's just gambling. So <laughs> let, let's go here for a second, Nick. When, when you are in the midst of, of struggle, I'm sure during your business career, there has been times where you felt like you're kicked down, you were on the ground and you're like, man, am I going to be able to get back up? What helped you stay the mindset of, I know I'm not just going to do this, but it's inevitable that this business, this opportunity that I'm creating is, is going to help me all the way through to the end. How did you stay and persevere? The first concept on that is that I've really leaned into the question of who said it was supposed to be easy. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. For real, for real. And, and it, I'm not saying that's not a, a jab at you. I'm saying people go in thinking, oh, it's just incremental improvement and step. step up the ladder at a time. And no, like it, you take your lumps and that is how it's supposed to be. Mm. There has to be a degree of learning. If you go into a situation where things are hitting the fan and you're in a, you know, let's say a war or something like that, you want to be surrounded by Navy SEALs who are hardened, battle tested, mm. seen the ups and downs, seen all kinds of situations. That's the, probably the safest place you can be around people that have seen the highs and the lows and the ins and the outs. So I don't, you know, just, just going through incremental improvement it's just not enough in the marketplace today. So 
what we look at in our toughest situations is what's the lesson and how do we make sure this never happens again? That's the number one rule. Mistakes are okay. We move quickly. We move at a very fast pace as a company. We try to innovate very quickly. So problems along the way are going to come up. It's just how do we never make them again? The first biggest mistake we ever made. I talked about we, how we buy it, how we were purchasing properties in the middle of the global financial crisis. We had this deal that was like, I don't know, 60-ish percent off below market, a smoking purchase price, a smoking purchase price. The issue was the local economy was very clearly going the wrong direction, and we ignored the signs because our purchase price was so good. We're like, man, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if this local economy tanks, we're buying so low that we can still get out. What happened, Brigham, was that it ended up being worse than we thought and it going the wrong way faster. And the deal took longer, which they always do. So the leasing effort expired and slowly went backwards. And we got out of the deal and we had great returns, but it took so much time and effort to, you know, we're in a canoe and we're fighting against the current of the market, mm. right? Instead of going with the current, there's times where the market's, you know, at your back and pushing you to more and more success, higher returns, great things for you and your investors. So we had to fight against the current of the market and by the time we wrapped the deal up and paperwork was signed, we all dropped our pens and kind of just like took a big breather. The rule was we never go into a market that the fundamentals are going the wrong direction. So we need to lean into the economics of what we're doing. We need to look broader and locally at what the state's doing, what the county's doing, what the city's doing, what things look like on the on the money, you know, uh, cost of uh, cost of uh, loans to purchase. All of those were going against us. We still bet because we had such a good purchase price. So Warren Buffett has a famous quote. I'd rather have a fair deal. Wait, no, let me, excuse me. I'd, have a, I'd rather have a great asset at a fair price than a fair asset at a great price. Mm. And I'll never make that mistake again. And we will never make the mistake of not having the economics on our side and over diving into the fundamentals. Since then, we've done the opposite, especially when we saw industrial booming. I love industrial as an asset class. I have a huge case study. I believe it's going to be very, very, very positive for the next decade or so. We leaned in an industrial very early on, and we saw record gains that arguably we didn't work super hard for. Our due diligence on the front end was very deep. Our market research was very deep, but once we purchased the assets, we weren't just working 80 hour weeks trying to grind out percentage points on the deal. It was the biggest effort was done on the front end. So that's huge for us is the economic, uh, the economic underwriting, not just the deal underwriting. Mm -hmm. And that has proven so successful for us. And it's really the fundamental of our income fund. So if you look at today, just today, Goldman Sachs came out and said the stock market what they see as the S&P 500, the best, arguably the best 500 companies in the world, the S&P 500, mm -hmm. they see as an annual return of 3% per year for the next decade. The last 10 years was 13% average per year. Mm -hmm. So they see a 3% average per year for the next decade for the S&P 500. So that tells me if we underwrite to the same thing as Goldman Sachs, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that they have good... Uh, underwriting and, and, and analysts on the team. If we see the same thing, then I'm very happy with where we're at doing, you know, teen returns in the real estate market on a fixed income basis based on single family homes, single family mortgages. I love that position. But now we're looking 10 to 20 years in the future, whereas the stock market has more volatility. So all that to be said, the underlying economics of markets, of asset classes, of, you know, things in general you know, of the financial markets are so important. And if you look into those, you can see what your game plan will look like moving forward. Love it. Now, one of the reasons I think people hopped on this call was they wanted to hear what CPR means to, to Nick and to myself and how we can create profitable real estate. That's the CPR. So sure. what is the secret? If you're telling a brand new person that is wanting to get into real estate, What's the secret to create profitable real estate from these distressed properties and make those assets something that isn't just something that will make a little bit of money, but will start to build that sexy word cash flow? <laughs> so go ahead. Nick. Yeah. So the top, 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 you have to have a, you, know, you have to have an attractive basis. The purchase mm -hmm. price of the asset has to make sense. Period. Oh, yeah. So if you're buying, 
you know, I don't want to take jabs at any assets in the marketplace today. But if you're buying 30 years up front of cash flow, like you saw in multifamily and, you know, 2021, et cetera, some of those, most of those deals need more CPR today than they did back then, right? They have mm -hmm. a lot of issues. So your purchase price and your timing is extremely important. That's why I say, that's why I like to stress so much is because your basis is lower. You have more room of, you know, to, for unforeseen circumstances and things coming up. One is your basis. You have to buy right. Mm -hmm. The second is you have to have a game plan and that has to increase value somewhere in the chain of the deal. Okay. Buying and holding is great. Buying and holding and improving is the real juice of real estate. There has to be some driver of added value, added income, added property appreciation. And you have to understand that you have to identify that on your own. The mm -hmm. third, if you're buying hard assets on real estate, you want to understand the tax benefits and how you can oh, maximize yeah. that on your side, because there's huge opportunities if you're buying the asset. Alternatively, if you're going into fixed income, the benefit is you have to understand the horizon, the time horizon for that asset and the stability. So you, you kind of have to choose. If you're choosing cash flow, you want to know that it's going to be there for a very long time, that you don't have to have your hand on the wheel day in and day out on each piece of every single thing you know, of that. On the other side, if you are managing actively and it is a hard asset, you get the tax benefit of that. So you kind of get mm -hmm. paid for it. So those are the three that I would tell you on that side is why I, what I'd be focusing on in today's market. And I'd be focusing in that order. I love that. So just to recap, you said, make sure you've got a great purchase price. And that basis is as low as reasonable, right? You want to make sure it's fair, but you want a great asset. And then you go and you focus on those value adds. What are some of the things that you can do to either increase more like revenue or increase property value because you added certain things? Uh, units or you did different things. And then sure. that last thing is focusing on the tax benefits. And that's huge. Sometimes you can get into a deal because you're like, this is going to increase my opportunity to exercise some tax benefits and displace some of the other income that you're making. So when you're looking long-term, uh, uh, let's talk about wealth generation, not just one deal at a time. Sure. What is wealth generation in your experience? And how is that so essential for, for anyone that's getting into business? Sure. Let's oversimplify it so people know Sounds exactly great. what we're talking about. There's only two buckets of wealth generation if you want to think of it that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. The first is going to be cash flow, fixed, just so you know how much money is coming in the door. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one is cash flow, the second is appreciation. It's an asset that is going to increase in value. You buy it today at one price, it sells tomorrow at a higher price. So those are the two buckets that we're talking about here. Okay. I would argue that the first bucket is you need a base income, whether it's from your W-2 or from personal, whatever, to get to these and really maximize these. But let's mm -hmm. talk about these. Fixed income, having a cash flow and appreciation, having a, a higher sales price later on. Uh, both of those, as you lean into investment side, like there's a balance of both. Most people think appreciation because we're trained to think appreciation from the stock market, right? That's kind of the, mm -hmm. the classic tool for building wealth over a long period of time. And it's been great for 100 plus years, you know. Yeah. But um, the cash flow side, I would argue, anytime you're underwritten by a bank, right? Let's say you're going for a loan for anything. They are looking at your cash flow. Mm -hmm. They're not looking at your overall net worth. They can, but that's usually secondary. And any bank underwriter will tell you that because they have to sue you to get at your net worth. But your cash flow, that's day one. If they underwrite your cash flow and that checks out. So to a bank, which are arguably the best underwriters in the world, cash flow is king. Hmm. So what I'm looking at out of the gates, let's say I had a high income. Let's say I was, you know, over 250 grand, which makes me an accredited investor. So I have this whole world of opportunities to tap into for investment decisions. The first thing I'm looking at is fixed income. I'm probably looking at things like uh, real estate fixed income funds. I'm probably looking at other opportunities that have a degree of, uh, you know, 10 to 20 year horizons, things that are long term that I can bet on that cash flow. Once I add a stream of income that I really trust usually added by a number of assets, maybe a dozen plus 20 something, then I'm looking to appreciate. I don't see a huge case study for the stock market over the next decade. I'm probably more in line with Goldman Sachs on that. And 
my bet is higher inflation for the next decade, at least mm -hmm. inflationary pressures. So on yeah. my side, real estate's more hard assets are going to be the real choice. For me, gold, okay, fine, but it doesn't cash flow, right? Even if it right. was going to appreciate, it doesn't cash flow. Bitcoin, okay, fine. There's all kinds of stuff we could dive into there that's beyond what this conversation is. Real estate checks all the major boxes to me, which is why it's such a good choice against inflation where what we see. So mm -hmm. I would go real estate in that sense. So I'm looking for a fixed income opportunity. I like debt. That's probably my favorite instrument right now is investing yeah. in debt. And then on the appreciation side, I like real estate. So those are the two biggest boxes that I see checked with those asset classes. Beautiful. And if someone doesn't have any cash flow yet, I'm sure they have this desire to go figure out how to do that. What would you say for a brand new investor? What would be the thing that you would want them to say they need to start on? What do they need to focus on to be able to identify which asset class has the highest potential for them to create that cash flow and sustain it long term? I would say the first step is they need to decide, are they full time or are they passive? Mm. And if they if they say I'm all in on real estate, then I'm going to shoot and say hell yeah, I love real estate. I love the underlying fundamentals of real estate. Get as close to the best people as you can. Learn as mm. much as you can. There's a time to learn and there's a time to earn. And if you mm. cut it too early and you're trying to earn too early in real estate, you'll cut your full career short by trying to get there too early. Get around the best people and learn from the best. If you want to be passive then I'd say that there's all kinds of you know opportunities to invest, to learn along the way passively. I'd say either way, whether you're passive or active, meaning if you're passively investing with someone else and they are managing the assets and they're doing the hard work, or if you want to do it yourself, I respect both. Step one is education. Amen. So the first, edu the first, the first, the first investment I'm making until I'm, you know, if I had to start all over until I'm making 250 grand a year, I, everything I do is to learn. Everything I do is to learn because once you're north of 250, you're an accredited investor anyway, and you have all, the whole world opens up in the investment world. So I'm sprinting to that number. If I'm restarting, I'm putting money into classes. I'm putting money into books. I'm spending money on Audible. I'm spending my time learning on, on YouTube. I'm spending money on cheaper investment options where I can learn and chart with them and understand why they make the decisions they do. Beautiful. And you're focusing on the things that matter the most. You're building that, that asset of your mind, your skill set, your tool set. And as you focus on that mindset, skill set, tool set, you will start to see more opportunities. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a linguist. I absolutely love learning different languages. So the, the thing that I noticed when I'm learning a new language is if you don't actively listen, you miss every word that is said to you. It's when you are actively searching for the word that you just studied that day that you'll start to hear it. In investing, it's that same process. If you aren't reading the books, you're not listening to the, the mentors and getting out there and talking with the coaches, the people that are, are in it day in, day out, and they're in that trenches, you miss out on so much that could change the trajectory of your life. So I thought that was great advice, Nick. Thank you. I, I totally agree. Educate so that you can focus on learning. So eventually you can remove that L and start to earn. So wonderful. Absolutely. When, when you are talking about a success story, this is something I love talking about with marketing with, with different people. What is a success story to you? And I'm going to preface this with one of my favorite quotes by Earl Nightingale. He says, success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. So when you think of a success story in real estate, in your business, what does that mean for you, Nick, personally? So I'll say this. There's a lot of deals we could brag about. We've taken mm -hmm. our lumps too. So it's not, it's yeah. definitely not just, you know, like championship after championship deal. I didn't, the distressed assets were great. And I loved the foreclosure business. I loved all kinds of things. It's scrappy. It's quick. It moves quick, huge opportunities. But what we looked for after the whole, after we dug into distressed assets, there's a lot of mess that comes with it. There's yeah. lawsuits that come with it. There's people that lost properties and they're not happy about that. There's, you know, we stuck to the commercial side on the foreclosure side. So it was businesses. It was a lot more BKs and lawsuits than we weren't kicking families out of homes. 
right? So mm-hmm. that's good. I never wanted to have that on my record or have that in, you know, in the back of my head. But as we evolved, I did want to get away from that because that still didn't make me feel as great dealing with some of those situations. Where we're at today, I consider a huge success. Even the name Saint is because I feel like we've created a win-win-win on how we manage assets, how we invest. That's something I'm really proud of, honestly. So let me define that. We still deal with distressed assets, and I still think it's a huge opportunity, but we work more in the single family house, the single family residential markets. Okay. So the difference today and the difference is what we used to do is today, our goal is to keep the owner, the property owner, the homeowner in the property. I love that. That makes me feel way better. And the added benefit, so it's a benefit to them. So that's a win. The added benefit to us and our investors is that it gives us 10, 20, 30 years of payments because we're talking about mortgages. We invest in mortgages. Mm -hmm. That's our business today for our fixed income fund. So we keep homeowners in their homes. We also get 10, 20, 30 years of payments to count on. So we have a long-term stable outlook on the market backed by arguably the most stable asset class in the country, single family houses. And then the third win is banks. So after you're buying, you know, let's say our, our peak was about 10 million a week that we were buying from banks. We were always in the market. They knew who we were. I was a young kid. I stuck out like a sore thumb. So all that, all doing all that, we still have those relationships. So now when we work with them, we get to clean up their books. Hey, you know, reserve requirements are this today. We have to unload some of these bad loans. You know, Nick, what can you guys take this quarter? What are you taking this month? What are you after right now? And we can trade. We'll buy, you know, we'll clean up their books and we'll buy distressed assets for them. And we get to get on the phone with homeowners and say, hey, why aren't you paying your mortgages right now? What's stopping you? Oh, you know, the mortgage is 2000 a month. I can only afford 1500 Great. If we drop your payment to 1500 and extend your loan by X amount of years so that that makes sense for both sides, do you want to stay in your property? Yes. Great. That's a Perfect. win-win. So when you, when you dive into what's success to me, obviously returns. I am return driven. I am success driven. I am money driven at some degree because I owe that to our investors, right? right? Otherwise I'd be in philanthropy, which I think is great also, right? But that's not the business. We're in the fund business. Mm -hmm. So we owe our investors returns and safe returns, which is what we're working on in our fund. And that's the point of our fund. So that's a win that we get to do that with a really long 10, 20, 30 year outlook and keep homeowners in their homes. So that's a huge win for me. If you talk, you know, if you zoom out more to life, I'm looking at three things I consider success. It's health, it's wealth, and it's legacy. That's kind of, you know, my foundation Mm -hmm. for a good life. Health, that's spiritual, that's physical health, that's, you know, um, you know, family and relationships. Wealth, it's having the income, it's having the net worth. Uh, Legacy, you know, I'm big, I'm involved with my church. I'm very involved with different philanthropy causes. I love education, especially entrepreneurship education. Teaching people how to invest and run their businesses is very important. So those are my buckets of success. At Saint, I think we found a huge, the exact definition of success I was looking for. I'm very proud of our team, what we've accomplished. And then personally, that's usually what I'm looking for at success. Beautiful. Wonderful answer. I I, I absolutely agree. When you have your health, your wealth, and your your I want to say your relationships, but it's really that legacy that you you said that that's what you leave behind. We we don't get to take any of our wealth with us. We we don't. But when you pass on ideas that can absolutely shift someone's perspective on what what life is about, and you can help someone and genuinely know that that you did right by them consistently, man, that that makes you feel good while you're making money. So I, I love that. Thank you for the perspective. Now, Nick, in the last few moments we have together, what is a bit of encouragement that you would give yourself as a young investor that if you would have just had this little nugget of wisdom, man, it would have unlocked doors for you. It would have changed the way you saw things. What what would you tell yourself? I would say two things and they're kind of two halves of the same coin. I'd say go bigger. I want to say, you know, I have a personality that already goes big. It always tries to bite off more than it can chew. You know, I'm always trying to go after the biggest opportunities that I can possibly see. But if I could go tell myself again, I'd say don't spend time on things that won't that won't get you to where you want to be. 
because I had smaller businesses. I had things along the way and they're part of my origin story. They're part of things that were very important. They taught me so much, but also I could have gone bigger sooner. And then the other side is have higher standards. I think along the way, I, I have a big heart for my, for our team. There's a lot of things that I, I wanted everybody to come with us all the way to the end. And that's just not realistic. And I realized that probably, you know, too little, too late. And today I'm proud to say that by having higher standards, we get to connect, you know, our Saint team is better than it's ever been by 20X, 100X. Mm -hmm. And they're amazing people that we could go the distance with forever. So it's, you don't give one up by having higher standards. You don't like, you know, lose connection. And, you know, it's this cold organization. You actually find better people that are better suited, that are better connected, that care more about each other and want to support each other's initiatives even more. So I would say go bigger sooner and deal with the best people, have higher standards across the board for everything. Beautiful. High standards, I think, is something that sets your vision high enough that if you fall to your standard and your standard is high enough, you will be able to achieve that success. But if your standard's really low, you typically will fall to your standard when it's inconvenient. So I, I think that's a beautiful way to think about it. And thank you for your insights, how you've been able to, to deliver any, any final thoughts that I didn't ask this question, but man, I wish you would have asked me this Brigham. Tell me, tell me what's that, that idea that's burning in the back of your mind. I would say I, cause I love the focus of your podcast. I love the fact that leveling up, I'm a growth personality myself. I mm -hmm. think I, I always want to be around growth personalities. If people are interested in leveling up their understanding of economics and investing strategies. I'm a huge growth person myself. We mm -hmm. give away all this information for free. I'll never awesome. have a course. We'll never do anything like that. They can check it out at saintinvestment.com slash resources. And we're Thank diving you. in on tons of economic studies, breakdowns, charts, everything, the underlying decisions that we make and we see. And they'll probably find it really, really uh, fascinating with the community that you've built. Wonderful. So guys in the show notes as well, I'll make sure to tag that in there, but go check out Nick. He's an awesome guy. So grateful to have this conversation, Nick, great insights. I, I took a whole page of notes, so I appreciate the the insights that you, you shared with us. And as I say to every single person, God bless. And I, I wish you all the best in leveling up your life and your relationships, your, your lifestyle, your community, everything. So God bless and take care. Brigham, I had a blast. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. It's a pleasure.